Who's to govern Israel? Another deadline to agree a government has come and gone after Benny Gantz gave up trying. The mandate is now with the Knesset, but will it be able to move things forward? And what's causing this breakdown in Israeli politics? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the programme. I'm Hala Mahiyadeen. Israel is facing an unprecedented third election in under a year. That's after opposition leader Benny Gantz was unable to form a coalition government. That attempt came after Benjamin Netanyahu, who's seeking a record fifth term as prime minister, also failed. Neither has managed to secure the backing of former defence minister Avigdor Lieberman, whose Israel Bitenu party is seen as a kingmaker. But for Benny Gantz, the problem isn't Lieberman, it's Netanyahu. Netanyahu Netanyahu needs to remember Israel still has a democracy. Even if it doesn't appeal to him, he should have come to terms with the fact that the outcome of the elections requires him to negotiate directly with no blocks or barriers. These are a blunt and violent attempt to deprive the voters from their democratic choice. Most of the people choose a liberal unity government headed by blue and white. Most of the people voted to weaken the power of extremists, and most of the people voted to go on a different path from that of Netanyahu in recent years. Well, Netanyahu insists he wants a coalition, but not at the expense of Israel's security. He accuses Gantz of being willing to form a minority government with terror supporters who receive instructions from Israel's enemies. This is a reference to Israeli Arab politicians who the Prime Minister claims are trying to destroy Israel. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment, but first, Harry Fawcett has the latest from West Jerusalem. Well, the one newspaper referred to what's about to start as injury time in this entire process. It's never happened before, but for the next 21 days, the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, will theoretically have the power to nominate one of its members. It could even be Benny Gantz or Benjamin Netanyahu, even though they've failed so far, to try to form a coalition government if they get the magic number, a majority, 61 seats in that Knesset uh, to recommend uh, anybody who they view has the realistic possibility of forming a government. But so far, there seems little prospect of that happening. Uh, everybody is sticking to their positions very rigidly. Netanyahu is refusing to go second in any rotational deal with his rival Benny Gantz. Benny Gantz says that he won't sit under a prime minister who is under or facing indictment. Uh, and he wants Netanyahu to negotiate only from the basis of his own party, not the wider block of other allied right-wing and religious parties that he currently comes with as a package deal, according to some reports, certainly not later than next, early next week, uh, to, according to most reporting, is the final decision by the Attorney General whether or not to indict Benjamin Netanyahu in three separate corruption cases, and in one of them whether or not to include the charge of bribery. Uh, how that will play out, of course, will also be very important in what happens in the next three weeks. Well, for more on this, I'm joined by our guests in Tel Aviv. We have Yossi Belin, a former Israeli Minister of Justice and member of the Knesset with the Labour Party. In Lundy, Yossi Meckelberg, Professor of International Relations at Regents University. He's also an Associate Fellow for the Middle East and North Africa programme at Chatham House. And in West Jerusalem, Mitchell Barrick, CEO of Kivon Global Research, a political consultancy. Gentlemen, welcome to you all. If I may start with you, Yossi Balin, what, in your view, has prevented the formation of an Israeli government? The main thing is the result of the elections. The, the first round uh, in, uh, in April and the second round in, in September, no party won the elections. And as a result of, of that, uh, both of them tried to create a coalition with another party. This other party of uh, Victor Lieberman uh, was not ready to join uh, with uh, neither left or right. And as a result of it, we are stuck. The question is whether the, the two big parties, uh, Blue, White and the Likud, may, may uh, join together in order to have a unity government. 
and uh, so far it has not happened. It may happen in the, in the coming 21 days that they have in order to choose perhaps a prime minister. And would, would you agree with that, Yossi Meckelberg, uh, due to the feelings of Avigdor Lieberman, uh, the, the blue and white and Likud simply can't get together. Uh, so where does, the, where does the parliament go from here? Well, I agree with Yossi. First and for all, it's a numbers game and the numbers don't add up. You need to act somehow to get to a majority or to get a minority government, but with enough people not to object or oppose it in, in the Knesset. So this, is the, the, this was the result of two elections, not, not one. But in, in the midst of it, there, there is the, the plot, but there are subplots that influence it. For instance, different people have, are playing different games to serve their own political future and career. You have the big elephant in the room is, of course, the indictment of prime minister or the potential indictment of Prime Minister Netanyahu. He's one easy one that the uh, blue and white are ready to sit in government considering that in the next week or two he might be indicted. Lieberman, who is a long-time nemesis of the Prime Minister, sees an opportunity to enhance his position and come with all sorts of constitutional changes. And if this is the situation and you can't, the numbers don't add up, uh, maybe third election might be the only, the only solution forward. However, the question if the electorate is ready actually to put aside differences and support government uh, parties that can form a coalition there. That's an interesting point that you raise, Yossi Meckelberg. I want to pick up on it in just a second and tackle the, the possibility of a third election in just a second. But first of all, to you, Mitchell Barrack, what would you say is the stumbling block? We have had several attempts to try and form an Israeli government. In your view, <coughs> what is preventing the formation of this government? Well, it's, it's interesting because where the Israeli people always criticize us, their politicians, for not having any backbone, not having any ideology and always selling out, it seems that people are stuck in their positions here. And they're stuck and they're not willing to compromise on any issues. And what happens is they've been locked in the two major parties, which is really blue and white, which got one more seat than the Likud, and the Likud are locked in. Because Netanyahu is saying, I'm going to be indicted, even if he's going to be indicted, Everyone knew about it, and he's the leader of Likud, and he's going to, you know, he's going to, you know, run this ship, and he's going to go to elections if he has to, and he's not backing down, and he's not resigning. At the same time, Blue and White was elected on a platform of no sitting with uh, Netanyahu if he's under indictment, if he's indicted, or he's going to be indicted, or or un until we know for sure. So they can't go back to their electorate and say we're willing to sit in a government with a person who has an indictment. And Netanyahu has no reason to, to, to join a government where, you know, he has to give up the prime ministership. So it is a clash of egos to a certain extent, but it's more a, an ideology at this point, which is pretty rare in Israeli politics to see that they're sticking to something and not deciding. We're in this 21 days, or we're going to be in this 21 days in, in just a moment, and this is where the activity is going to happen because every party has got to realize that the Israeli public may be punishing them severely in the elections again. Who has the most to lose by not backing down? Let me come to you, Yossi Balin. Well, I believe that it is not a clash of egos. What you have here is a prime minister who does not want to go to his trial as somebody who is not in the seat of the prime minister. This is his main uh, motivation. And if the uh, blue and white is saying, no way, we will not sit under you, uh, uh, under you, we will not serve under you uh, if you are indicted, then you have a clash. Not because everybody wants to be a prime minister for long. There is a, a, an agreement that it will be a rotation government. Each of them will have two years. The question is whether the two years of Netanyahu will be from now uh, until two years from now or of, of uh, Gantz. What might happen is that in the Likud itself, there will be a kind of a rebellion. They will have primaries for the prime minister in, in, the, in the coming days. And if it is not Netanyahu, then the way for a rotation government uh, is open because, regretfully, the disputes so far are not ideological about the peace with the Palestinians or about social issues, but only about serving or not serving under Netanyahu.
Uh, Mitchell Barak, would you agree with that? This is Netanyahu is the, the stumbling block. It's not an ideological issue. This is a, a man who doesn't want to uh, be indicted for, for, for corruption. Right. Well, he's using the entire electoral system, the entire Knesset and the entire Israeli people. He's holding them hostage so that he can uh, have a better trial and have a better outcome. I would call that an ego egomaniac problem uh, if, if I had to look at it, because he's got the whole country uh, he's holding for that reason. Um, I think that Netanyahu at this point uh, has, has the most to lose, because if this indictment comes down in the next week or so, he is going to look like a damaged prime minister. It's unprecedented to have a sitting prime minister who's under indictment. And that's when the rebellion that Yossi Balin is speaking about could happen, because once he starts sliding in the polls, the Likud is not going to stick with that. They've stuck with him for two elections now, and he has failed to form a government. He's, they're not going to give him a third chance if he's really sliding in the polls. And the way Netanyahu runs the campaign in general is he likes to trail, and he likes to be losing. He's the only leader in the world that the day before, a few days before the election says, I'm losing and I'm going to lose this election because he gets his faithful out. No one is going to take that chance again in the Likud to bring him up to the next election day and hope that the people come out. So I think that's what a lot of it is. It's not ideological. I mean, I agree with uh, Yossi Balin that it's not ideological about the peace process, about the economy. It is an ideological battle at this point of how they went to the voters. And Netanyahu went to the voters and said, I'm the leader of Israel. I'm the best guy that can do it. And I can't accept anything else. And, and it's an ego in that he won't step down now for the next two years. He will not leave the prime minister's office or the prime minister's home. From Benny Gantz and the blue and white point of view, it is also ideological that they faced the voters and said, we will not sit with the prime minister under indictment. They can't change that. That's why they're at loggerheads at this point. If Netanyahu would move out and say, you know, he's willing to resign, there would be a government in five minutes. If the Likud would give another candidate or there would be a breakaway either through the blue and white party with Lapid breaking off or in the Likud with some of those people breaking off, there would be a government. And that's where it seems to be a jam now. OK, Yossi Mecklenburg, would you agree with that assessment? Again, I think we use the eulogy in, in, in a different way here. It's not that we have parties, especially the, the larger parties that present to the voters, to the electorate, diametrically uh, opposite ideologies, as, as Yossi Bailey mentioned earlier, about, about uh, peace with the Palestinians, about uh, the place of Israel in the region, about social inequalities that are growing all the time, about uh, how to govern a country where there is so much corruption. It's their main ideology is to be in power and then to think what they do next. Actually, those are the small parties that are more ideological because they, they also their voters are more coherent and, and more unified ideologically. It's just to break the impasse between the big parties. And yeah, I, I think the previous speakers are right. If Netanyahu sets aside and go and you know, deal with his legal issues, then there, there, it opens all sort of possibility, a, 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 narrow, a, a narrow coalition, a bit wider coalition, a unity government. But right now, the stumbling block is, is Netanyahu himself. And if all of it, there is Lieberman that he plays his own game because he wants to position himself, though he leads a small party, but actually to punch way above his weight. Well, now the... the, the... The responsibility is now with the Knesset. It's up to the Knesset to try and uh, find someone who may form a government. Uh, do you think that this will be possible or are we heading to the polls uh, before uh, the year is out? Yossi Balin. Well, the question is, uh, if there is an indictment, it might be today, it might be in the coming days, uh, and it might change the whole picture. It is true that today, when people are asked in, in public opinion polls, would you change your vote uh, if uh, Netanyahu is indicted for bribery, uh, the changes are not too big. But you, never, you can never actually uh, know it in advance. So once it happens, then we will see if there are real changes. And if the situation of Netanyahu deteriorates in the public opinion polls, it would legitimize a change in the Likud. And it is true that if there is another leader, whoever, in the Likud rather than Netanyahu, 
then it would be uh, very, very easy to have a unity government with uh, blue and white. So, so then, uh, would you agree with this, Mitchell Barrack, the kingmaker in this entire process would be the Attorney General? Uh, to a certain extent. I mean, it, the, his timing is off. He's taken too long. We have an idea that the attorney general is going to come down, at least in one, if not all, of the three cases with bribery. But I think what we're not even taking into account is it is correct that by the time he, the prime minister is under indictment, his status changes, and he may be on a downward slide. But we haven't even discussed it. A week and a half ago, you know, 300 missiles were, came in through Gaza. Uh, Israel is involved in, you know, attacking Iranian targets in Syria. Uh, a few missiles, people in Tel Aviv, in Modi'in, in the bulk of the center of the country were in their bomb shelters. That can't go on, meaning all you need is some kind of security change like that, where people will say, Netanyahu, it's enough already, meaning there's a, a real instability that's taking place in Israel now. And it's both with the security and also with the economy. The government is not functioning. It hasn't functioned since last November, really, when a lot of government contracts had to stop because it was during an election campaign. So you have people that aren't getting paid. You have governments that can't, you know, ministries that can't have new initiatives. Israel is, is strategically is falling behind. So anything can change. Any type of current events can change and bring those parties together. And what you're going to see now with all the members of Knesset is, yeah, you got 21 days. There are some members of Knesset that this is their second term of office in, as being new members of Knesset, and they haven't done anything. Well, so, not quite. And there are members of Knesset that have been there 10 and 20 years that may lose their jobs. Well, let me put it to you then. Surely, given the security challenges which Israel is facing, given the fact that the government, has, as you say, Mitchell Barrack, is not uh, functioning right now, given everyone is waiting for a potential indictment to come down, surely this is a time for leadership. <clears throat> and given the situation, which of the leaders of the numerous parties have covered Good. themselves in glory? Well, I would say that uh, next week in America is a very big holiday. It's called Black Friday, and everything is on sale, and everything is marked down, and people, there are the most amazing deals that take place online and at every retailer in America. And I think that we're going to see a kind of Black Friday in the Knesset where we're going to see unions that people didn't expect. We're going to see people coming forward because these members of Knesset have 21 days to keep their job for the next four years, or some of them may be out, and some of them may never see the Knesset again from the inside of the building. And that's going to be motivating them, as well as this is really bad for Israel, for the Israeli people, and for the democratic process. Let's talk about the Israeli people then. Yossi Mekelberg, given the situation, the arguably the lack of leadership that we are seeing, the fact that there is still no government being formed, uh, despite all the events happening, uh, what would you say the Israeli people are making of this? Well, I think first and foremost, they, they, they created this situation. I know it's, it's not popular to blame the people for, for a situation, but it's their pattern of voting, of vote which created this situation. And I think they, if there is a third election, they, they need to rethink, go back to the drawing board and think, is this the way we want to vote again? Or we actually not going to get exactly what we think we are going to get because eventually they get very little and vote for other party in the way that coalition can be formed. But in the meantime, they need to put pressure on the politician. And this is an intolerable situation. As Mitchell says earlier, it's not that we are talking about a country that lives in peace with its neighbors and everything is, though it's a, the, the country of milk and honey, that everything is milk and honey, is a country that's facing from, from domestic to international issues Every single, every single day, and they need a stable government. And it's untenable that there is an interim government for a year that has all the power in the world but have very little responsibility or accountability. That's the time for people to express it the way that you expect in a democracy. People will go down and tell their elected members that they can't tolerate this situation anymore. So, Yossi uh, Meckelberg, how do you think a third election would change? Uh, how do you think the voting public would uh, change allegiances? I'm not so sure it's going to change. I think people are entrenched in their position and the support uh, in, in, in the parties. Uh, the small, party, small parties are definitely can consolidate their vote, whether it's the rabbis tell them how to vote, the, the national religious one. 
but I think uh, there, you need to see at least movement between, between the blocks and within the blocks towards the bigger parties. In a way, as we see it now, the bigger parties, we talk about big parties, but they are not big parties. They have roughly half of what they need in order to get a majority. And this is really, I think, the parties need to change the way they campaign. They need actually to adjust their platforms in a way that it will be palatable to, to more and more voters. And I think actually for also, it's part, I think, long-term education. What is democracy and in a democracy? What kind of compromises you are doing in order that you sometimes compromise or give up a bit of a representation in order to get better governance or governance at all? Okay, uh, Yossi Balin, if I could come to you, assuming the country does go to a third, an unprecedented third set of elections, uh, what do you think uh, these elections would change? Well, I'm not sure that we are uh, approaching a, a third round of elections. I believe that uh, the members of, of uh, Knesset are, uh, uh, are exposed to the criticism in the public opinion against the uh, the current situation and, and the, uh, sending them to the uh, ballot boxes uh, so early, they would try to have a unity government. This is the, the uh, more likely option. I personally would like to have a smaller center-leftist uh, government, but apparently it is not uh, likely to happen. So the efforts would be... And I, I also don't believe that it will be a kind of a Black Friday uh, in the Knesset, that everybody would like to be a prime minister and uh, get the signatures of his colleagues. No, the, it is mainly blue and white now, and the Likud, and they, have, they will have to see how can they uh, solve the problem. One option is, of course, uh, changing the leadership of Netanyahu uh, by having somebody else from the Likud, and then there will be a rotation government, no problem. Uh, there might be also some other solutions uh, but I, I believe that they both know that the elections will not be a real upheaval. According to all the public opinion uh, polls so far, it is going to be more or less uh, the same, unless the indictment of Netanyahu uh, and uh, his remaining in power uh, will have something to do with the affinity of the members of the Likud, or voters of the Likud, to their party, and that there will be a diminishing support for the Likud. That might be interesting. And um, Mitchell Barak, uh, I'll come to you uh, finally. If we head to a third election, do you think things will change, or will we end up with a similar kind of stalemate uh, to the one we have now? And if so, how do you think this situation will inform the campaigns moving forward? Well, I think uh, there's two things to consider at this point. One is that we don't really know who's running at this point, meaning the parties assumed the, the, after the first election that the same people would run again. And pretty much they did. They found a different way to, you know, make some of those parties. So you may have some of those smaller parties go into larger blocks, and you may have people coming into politics that are not there right now. And you, we, we can't underestimate who that could be or what they might do or what effect they would have. Because when, when we know that, Israel, that about 25 to 30 percent of the Israeli electorate doesn't decide until the last three or four days before the election. And we even have a precedent of a, a few years ago, a few elections ago, when the Pensioners Party got a lot of seats. They got like six seats in the Knesset and no one even knew who they were. And then they disappeared. So people may be more willing to take a chance and vote for some kind of new party that, that can break the stalemate. So that's one thing. So Blue and White and Likud and Lieberman, they all have to realize that, that there may be other people coming in running in different parties, including some people that may break away from those existing parties. So they're better off working with what they have. That's one thing. The other thing which I would say, if they, we go to third election, is the Israeli Arab community here. You have a million and a half voters here, or a million and a half citizens here, who have now, okay. they're now under attack for almost more than a year. In the last election, the one before that, and they came out really massively, 60% in the last election, and they lowered the threat, they, they, they raised a the threshold for some of the other parties. Okay, and that's why Mitchell. Likud and Blue and White lost. So you may have better participation now from the Israeli Arab community. Okay, Mitchell, I'm and afraid I'll have it. to cut you off there, but thank you to all of my guests. We are out of time. Thank you, Yossi Balin, Yossi okay. Meckelberg. And Mitchell Barrack, thank you too for watching. You can see this programme again anytime by visiting the website aljazeera.com or catch the show on the Al Jazeera YouTube channel.
or at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can join the discussion on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Halamoki Dean. But for now, from me and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye-bye. <laughs>